It's interesting to see how many people who like motorsport are also interested in aviation. Various discords that I'm a part of have channels devoted to things like Flight Simulator, DCS, other combat flight sims, and also aviation in general. But I guess they're not that too far apart. One uses aerodynamics to push itself into the ground, and one uses aerodynamics to keep it in the air. And there are so many people involved with cars and or racing that have licenses to fly helicopters or fixed wing aircraft. James May has or had a PPL, Richard Hammond's got a helicopter license, and then there's Nicky Lauder, Rob Walker, Colin Chapman, Matt Kenseth, Carl Edwards, Greg Biffle and Roman Grosjean, to name quite literally eight. And yes, there's the Whittington brothers as well. I'm not going to sit here and name every single racing driver that's got a pilot's license. I haven't forgotten anybody. I guess having a pilot's license offers two things. One is the convenience of flying a small plane into the airport near a racetrack and then flying it back out again. Especially for NASCAR drivers because then they're not waiting around in airports or having to drive mega amounts of miles. The other is that it gives you something to do. It gives you a little bit of a buzz in some cases or it can just be recreational relaxing, being the polar opposite of racing in close quarters. I used to fly gliders when I was about 13 or so. Wanted to join the Air Force, couldn't because of my asthma, that sort of thing. But then you get the likes of Nicky Lauda. For him, it was also business. The guy set up several airlines over the course of his life and ended up flying for them on occasion, and also used his ability to fly to call Boeing's bluff when one of his aircraft crashed in 1991. But another driver who was using an aircraft for business was Graham Hill. Graham Hill does not need much of an introduction. He is, after all, one of Britain's most accomplished drivers. He might not have the statistics to his name like Lewis Hamilton or Jackie Stewart, and Stewart held the most wins record for a time himself, but he has one thing that no other driver has, and that's the Triple Crown of Motorsport. Monaco, Indianapolis, and Le Mans. Or Formula One World Championship, Indianapolis, and Le Mans. Either way, only Graham has done it, and maybe Fernando Alonso is the one that can realistically get the closest in the current era. There might be a couple of others, maybe Verstappen if he decides to take on those two races, but who knows at this point. Hill won the F1 World Championship in 1962 and 1968, the first of those championships making him the first British driver in a British-built car to do so, when he won it with BRM. His second title came in 1968 while driving the Lotus 49 painted in the gold leaf tobacco colours, which is also a season where the racing world lost one of, if not its greatest ever all-round driver, Jim Clark. In between those two championships, Hill scored outright wins in the British Touring Car Championship and also attempted races in sports cars, before becoming the first man in many years to score a rookie win at Indianapolis in 1966, and then later his Le Mans victory in 1972. However, his Formula 1 career suffered a hefty setback in 1969 when he crashed heavily at Watkins Glen and broke both of his legs. Or both broke of his legs as I ended up saying the last time I tried to say that. Amazingly, despite the injuries, Graham was back in a Formula 1 car for 1970, driving for the Rob Walker Racing Team. Or to give them the full name, Brook Bond Oxo Racing Rob Walker. Brook Bond is a brand of tea, and Oxo make gravy. It might be the most British thing ever to happen in motorsport. Could really go for some Bovril right about now. Dunk some Yorkshire puddings in it. Oh. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah. Graham on his return wasn't anywhere near the driver he had been. Not only was he recovering from injuries, he was also getting older and the performance of Formula 1 cars had increased so much thanks to the advances in aerodynamics. As an indication, the pole time for the British Grand Prix in 1970 set by Jochen Rindt was four seconds faster than Hill had done two years prior. I'm saying two years prior here because the 1969 British Grand Prix was at Silverstone. Chapman had sent Graham to Rob Walker believing that Hill was done at the top level and he'd got Jochen Rindt in the car instead, although Rindt himself would be killed at Monza that same year. However, instead of going to a smaller customer team and having an inferior car, Chapman was able to sweeten the deal with a Lotus 72, just like the one Rint would have. Hill would get 7 points and 13th in the standings, but that's as good as it would get for the rest of his career. The following year, Hill was at Brabham and a 5th place at the Austrian Grand Prix and 2 points would be all he could muster, although 1972 was a slightly better season. It was only 2 points better, but that's also the year he won at Le Mans, so the season did have a silver lining, I guess. So with drives at teams like Brabham and Lotus drying up, and the likes of Stewart, Fittipaldi, Ix, as well as the entry and rise of Lauda happening, Hill needed some way of basically guaranteeing a seat in Formula 1. And the easiest way to do that in the 1970s was to start your own team. Now here come the predictable Lance Stroll comments. Now, I say the drives dried up. That implies that Hill was kicked to the curve for not being good enough. 
What had happened was that Hill had been really unhappy with the management of Brabham and left. The team at that point had been sold to Bernie Eccleston, and I can't find what exactly the unhappiness was caused by. Could be that Bernie and Graham had different ways of doing it, Graham being a bit like Jack while Bernie was more of a commercially minded guy, but who knows. So in late 1972, Graham set up his own racing team in time for the 1973 season. The factory was an industrial unit in West London that employed around 20 people and secured primary sponsorship from the tobacco company Embassy. Even though Hill was starting to fall down the Formula 1 pecking order, he was still a very popular television personality, so was still very marketable. But instead of building his own cars and going for the tried and tested plucky privateer starter pack as I call it, which was March chassis, Hewlett and Gearbox and Ford DFE, Hill had decided to go to a different company for his chassis, and that company was Shadow. The car that Hill had purchased was the Shadow DN1, built by the American company Shadow. The company had initially started out in sports cars, Can-Am to be precise, before deciding they were going to enter into Formula 1. Shadow as a team entered these all-black cars sponsored by Universal Oil Products, with the black car being very on-brand for a team called Shadow, and their two drivers were George Fulmer, an Arrows founder and 1969 Le Mans winner, Jackie Oliver. But this is how the car looked when it was painted up for the Hill team, all white with the red stripe to look like the cigarette packets, which is how the tobacco companies often dressed up their sponsorship of cars. These days, you got to buy your ciggies in a plain packet and they're under lock and key. How times have changed. The season was terrible for Hill. While the two shadow drivers each scored a podium in that season, Hill barely broke into the top 10, with his best position being 9th. He also got a 10th which would have netted 3 points for the season, but the point structure didn't exist yet. It was 1st to 6th in those days, with 9 going to the winner. So with that disappointment looming over the team, Hill decided to switch the cars for 1974, buying a Lola T370 that must be on the list of oddest looking cars ever constructed and entered into Formula 1. This car was based off Formula 5000 designs and was commissioned by Hill to be built by Lola for the team. That airbox is quite on the chunky side, isn't it? This year the team had more than just Graham racing and had four drivers over the course of the season. Guy Edwards was Hill's teammate for the majority of the season, with Peter Gethin and Rolf Stommelen also getting drives. It was in this season that the Hill team scored its first point, sixth at the Swedish Grand Prix. Shadow, meanwhile, in their brand new DN3, were third at Monaco and they got fifth in that same Swedish Grand Prix, and followed that with a sixth at the German Grand Prix. Hill still used the T370 at the start of the 1975 season, with Hill scoring a tenth and twelfth at the Argentine and Brazilian races after which the team entered the GH1, the team's first in-house designed car, although it was largely an evolution of the T370 as Hill had hired Lola designer Andy Smallman. When Hill failed to qualify for the Monaco Grand Prix, the race he'd won five times previous and earned the nickname Mr Monaco, he retired from driving altogether and focused on Tony Bryce in the other car, who was considered to be a rising star. Bryce was able to score a single point at the Swedish Grand Prix that year, while Alan Jones scored two points at the German Grand Prix, so it looked like there was this upward trend happening, but tragedy was going to strike at the end of 1975. On the 29th of November 1975, Graham had flown his Piper Aztec aircraft, a twin-engine propeller aircraft similar to the Beechcraft Baron, to Le Castellet Airport in the south of France, which is right next door to the Paul Ricard circuit. With him were Tony Alcock, a mechanic, Tony Bryce, team manager Ray Brimble, another mechanic in Terry Richards, and the car's designer, Andy Smallman. The plan was to test the new GH2 and fly back to London on the 30th. At around 3.30pm on the 29th, Graham flew first to Marseille, where he picked up the weather reports for the London area. He then filed an IFR flight plan taking him from Marseille Airport up to Elstree, just to the north of London, while having Luton Airport as his alternate. So, what does that mean? In very simple terms, there are two ways of flying. There's VFR and IFR. VFR means visual flight rules and is essentially you navigate with what you can see out of your window. There are certain things that you need to abide by, such as you have to be in visual contact with the ground at all times, and the visibility outside of those windows can't be less than a certain distance. What that means for navigation is this. Let's say I want to fly from Little Snoring Airfield in Norfolk to Fenland Airfield in Lincolnshire. To get there, as the crow flies, I have to fly over this piece of restricted airspace near Sandringham, one of the royal houses. The top of that airspace is 2,000 feet, and for whatever reason I can't climb up that high because of the cloud cover. I can, if need be, just fly around it, and then use the various roads, rivers, churches, wind farms or whatever to then get me to Fenland Airfield. Basically, take whatever route you need to take within the rules 
to get there. IFR is a bit different. You use predominantly your instruments to navigate. Also, the flight plan you file with the controllers is the route that you'll be taking, unless they tell you otherwise. You might be thinking, why are you telling us this? It will come apparent a tiny bit later on. Also, this is just very, very simplified. I know there's going to be a lot of aviation enthusiasts out there that know a lot more. Basic gist of it is, when you're under IFR, you can fly through different weather patterns, you can fly through clouds, you can do other bits and pieces. So it can really help out when you're flying through different weather patterns or maybe into a busy part of the world, London in this case. So I hope that's kind of explained it a little bit. It can be very confusing if you're brand new to this sort of thing. Maybe you're just a motorsport fan that's learning something new here and you might not be a motorsport and aviation fan like me and several others. The Hill team took off from Marseille at 5.47pm and headed north. Contact with the London area controllers was made around three hours later, with the weather for Elstree being given as 2,000 metres, just over a mile, and the cloud base being 300 feet above ground level. When the aircraft passed over to Heathrow Approach, the visibility at Elstree had dropped to 1,000 metres, and when the aircraft passed the Lambourne Radio Navigation Aid, the visibility at Elstree had now become 800 metres. When Hill got to Lambourne, he descended down to around 4,000 feet, and that time was now 20 past 9. Controllers told Hill to descend to 1,500 feet with any further descent at the pilot's discretion. At 28 minutes past 9, the controller contacted the aircraft and received no reply. Then the Aztec dropped off the radar entirely. Damon, in his book Watching the Wheels, says that the call sign had been 4-5 Yankee, but when Graham went to reply, all they got was 4-5 and then a click. The plane ended up here, within the Arkley Golf Course bounds, around 3 miles to the east and 130 feet above the airfield. The plane, with its landing gear down and the flaps extended, had clipped a tree, rolled to the right and crashed into a copse, instantly killing all six occupants on board. At the Hill family home, Damon was watching television with his sister, Samantha. At around 10pm, something came on that same television to say that a plane had gone down near Elstree Airfield and crashed onto a golf course. This then sent the alarm bells ringing in the 15-year-old Damon's head. Hang on a second. 10pm, golf course, Elstree, aircraft. Dad was supposed to be home around now, wasn't he? Damon then went into the kitchen where his mum and two of her friends were. The phone rang with his mum Betty saying, What do you want? I can't hear you. Never call this number again. And slammed the phone down. His mum must have assumed that it was a prank call, when really it was that utterly sickening thing that newspapers can do where they were basically trying to tell her that her husband was dead before she'd found out herself. It was at that moment Damon basically said, Mum, there's been a news flash. They've said a plane's crashed near Elstree. I think it might be Dad. Betty was in bits. She was screaming, shouting, and the police had to restrain her as she tried to get out to the golf course and see her husband, and eventually some doctors had to tranquilise her to calm her down. Samantha had also worked out that the police were at the door because of something to do with their dad. Damon wrote in his book that he'd been rehearsing this moment for years, because Graham was in the world's most dangerous sport, but since he'd retired, that guard had been let down. He said he went to sleep that night in the stunned sleep of a newly lobotomised patient. Graham was given probably the closest thing to a state funeral without actually being given one, such was the attendance of that funeral and his popularity as a driver. It was held at St Albans Cathedral and had so many people attending, but the Hill family was about to have things piled on them even more. The full crash report is available to read online. I'll leave you a link to it. And it's the opening portion of the report that starts everything off. And if you are into aviation, you might see a smoking gun right here. Aircraft type, Piper PA23250. Model, Turbo Aztec D. Nationality, none. Formerly USA. Registration, unregistered formerly November 6645 Yankee. The report later states that Hill had acquired his license in 1965, with a special purpose certificate issued by the FAA in the United States in 1966, which was later renewed in 1970, along with Hill getting his instrument rating. His instrument rating expired in 1971, along with that special purpose certificate. So at the time of the accident, Hill only had his UK-issued PPL certificate, which was valid until the December of 1975. His IFR certificate, though, had expired. So basically, Hill was driving without a license in a car that had no tax or MOT. 
And if you've ever seen one of these police shows where they pull somebody over and they say, well, you've got no tax, you've got no insurance, well, you can't get the car insured without the tax, so your insurance is invalid. So all of the certificates associated with that plane, so airworthiness, insurance, everything else, completely void. The report found no evidence that Hill was suffering from tiredness, nor had he been flying while under the influence of alcohol or any other substance, and the controllers were exonerated. Also, no fault was found with the airfield staff who needed to turn on the runway lights manually for Hill's arrival. There was also apparently a party that night at the airfield's flying club, but it looks like that part hasn't been mentioned. While an exact cause of the accident could not be ascertained, the investigators provided the reasoning that Hill had simply been disorientated in the fog, and he had mistaken the lights of Barnet for those of Borehamwood, and the golf course for the patch of land next to Elstree. There's also the possibility that a red signal light at a nearby railway station, or the red light that's on the back of a train, could have made Hill think that that red light was part of the glide slope management system, the Pappy lights, if you know what I'm on about. Also to note that earlier that day, another aircraft had abandoned a landing at Elstree and diverted to another airport, and this was with full air traffic control guidance and the visibility better when Hill attempted to land. To go back to the explaining of IFR versus VFR, Hill had attempted to land visually at an airport where only visual landings could be conducted when the airport would have been under instrument conditions. And also at the risk of what ifing, Hill could have diverted to Luton, which was his alternate airport, and conducted an instrument landing there, potentially avoiding the entire accident. The Times claimed that Hill had overestimated his flying abilities, while Betty was sued by Smallman's family. Because of all the insurance being void, settling all the lawsuits used up the vast majority of Hill's fortune, and the family had to leave their lifestyle behind and scale down their living, moving into a much smaller home in St Albans. Damon, the son of a two-time world champion and the only man to win the Triple Crown, ended up being a motorcycle courier and labourer to make ends meet. It's also been noted by Damon that Graham was supposed to be knighted in the New Year's honours for his services to motorsport, but he never got to receive the honour. Damon jokes that it might not have suited him, but it would have been deserved. It might also have made him behave himself, but who would have wanted that? Also, Graham would have been 95 next week. Crazy. 21 years later though, Damon would be a world champion himself. He calls it rescuing the family name after everything that happened on that night in 1975. So then, a look at the death of Graham Hill in a plane crash and what it ended up doing to the Hill family name before that name was rescued in 1996. If this has taught you something new about something that happened many years ago, then do like the video so I know I've done something interesting. And for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on anything else I do around here. Massive thanks to the fine bunch of lads over at Patreon for the continued support, and if you want to help keep the picture purchasing piggy bank topped up, then a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and other bits and pieces that you might need or want to know. Oh, and there's the affiliate links there as well, and there's memberships and the super thanks for the one and done donations. So until next time, I've been Aidan Mord, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.